This is Sam Griffin. I am an artist, I'm a painter, and uh, I am going to be painting for you now for the next hour. I would have loved to have a uh, playlist playing in the background. I would love to have some music going, but Facebook does not allow me to play uh, music in the background. So I've got earphones in. I might be listening to music later on while I'm painting just to be getting into the groove. Um, and you can, of course, um, you can, of course, put on your own music if you want to uh, listen while I'm working. So the title of this session is called Wise Old Man. And why is that? What is this all about? What am I going to be working on? And what is the subject of this session and this painting? Basically, for the last few years, I've been delving into uh, my own family history. And that is shrouded in mystery. I'm basically uh, descended from... Eastern European immigrants who came to London at the beginning of the 20th century and nobody's got any pictures of them, nobody knows anything about them, nobody's got any uh, real stories about them and so um, uh, it's all shrouded in mystery and that fascinated me and that got me really curious uh, in sort of figuring out who they were and what they were all about and um, I started sort of looking through old photographs of uh, Jews in Eastern Europe before the Holocaust, trying to figure out where my grandparents could have come from, what type of Jews were they, were they Hasidim, were they uh, Lithuanian, were they, where did they come from? Um, and, uh, and I don't know anything. I know that they ended up in London, and I know that they lived in the East End of London where Jews used to live. And um, anyway, this kind of took me down a long road um, and I started creating paintings on this subject, uh, looking for figures that may have represented what my great-grandfather would have looked like. And I imagined him as this bearded old uh, Jew, even though he wasn't old when he died, he was quite young actually, he wasn't even 50. But um, nevertheless, this image stayed in my mind. And I started asking myself, why? Why do I keep thinking of my great-grandfather in this way? And I realised that I was looking for this, searching for this ideal kind of... Uh, personality, this ideal kind of wise old man, as Carl Jung uh, describes it, as an archetype, an archetypical kind of personality of a person who has gone through strife and trials throughout their life, and as they've moved through it, they've integrated all of the things, all of the stages that they've moved through in their life. So you're a young person, and then you move on to being a, you know, a, a, a young adult, and then you move on to getting married, for example, and then having kids and all of that but you're still the same young person that you were and you kind of integrate all the lessons that you learned along the way and, uh, and until you become this sort of complete whole, this complete unified personality, which Carl Jung describes as the wise old man and in Jewish folklore we have the tzaddik, which kind of represents this idea. And so, without further ado, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go straight on to uh, painting. I hope you can all see me. I hope this is working. I hope I'm doing it right. Um, I might be talking as I go, describing my process and describing what I'm doing, and I might not, I might just get into a vibe, get into a flow, and I might just be painting, you can watch whatever you want to do. So, uh, first off, if you want to have a look down here, this is my palette, this is my little workstation here, so I've got my palette, which is absolute chaos, and uh, you'll see a lot of painters, they like to use uh, very clean palettes, and they like to sort of dot their, their paint all around, and they like to work very orderly and consistently. And my palette's sort of like all over the place. Look at that palette knife. That's a disgrace in the professional artist world. And I've got four main colours that I like to work with. I work pretty dark, actually. Most of my paintings, if you're familiar with my work, it's pretty dark. Um, I use sort of dark tones because I like that. Um, yeah, I don't know why, it's a kind of palette. So I've got Prussian blue. That's a favourite of mine. And I've got uh, some burnt umber here. And I've got some crimson alizarin. Uh, they all have fancy names. And ivory black. Um, so, without further ado, I've got my oil here. My linseed oil, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add some more to this jar here. And uh, I'm going to add a little bit of turpentine to that. Now this turpentine, this is synthetic turpentine. You can get natural turpentine, which smells lovely. This smells awful. So I'm going to open the window probably because the fumes are going to kill me. And, uh, wow, I really hope you can all hear me and the sound is working. 
give me a thumbs up. That'll help. I'm gonna open the window. And uh, so I've got my turps, I've got my oil, I've got my paints, I've got my brushes, I've got my palette. And now I'm gonna do, I think, uh, two paintings in the next hour. So I've got behind me an easel set up with uh, paper. It's like heavy duty paper. And on it, I've painted already a, le a layer of gesso. Gesso is what I use to prime my surfaces so that I can paint on it and it's not going to seep through to the surface. And uh, I think I'm going to do a painting that represents this sort of wise old man figure. And, uh, and you can join me as I go. So I'm just going to get into work and get into a flow. And I'm going to start talking again, perhaps as I'm working. So for now, you can just sort of relax and enjoy and uh, watch what's going on. What's that? And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to get straight into it. All right, I've got my, my paint set up here. So what I'm going to do, so I'll put this in first. So what I'm going to do is, <laughs> I'm, I, I never really like to, if I'm doing a painting in colour, so I never use black straight from the tube. I like to make black by mixing a few different paints. I like to make black by mixing uh, Prussian blue, alizarin crimson and burnt umber together. And they make this kind of rich, dark colour. Um, and some, depending on the ratio um, of the paints, and pigments, um, the black is always slightly different. And so there's a bit of black in the image that I want to create now. And so what I'm going to do, what's this? Oh, terms, that's disgusting. So what I'm going to do is take some of this kind of black mix that I just made, and uh, that's going to go, that's going to go over here. That's going to go over here like that. So sort of down here, a bit more like that. So I thought I'd actually be putting music on for myself, but finding that I'm actually probably nerves and adrenaline are putting me into a good, to a good flow, to a good space. So here, here we go. And I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to use some burnt. I'm going to use some brown. Sort of around here, and some crimson up here. Don't worry, it's all going to make sense. So I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about what I'm doing in my process. I'm going to be more mindful about whether or not you can see the actual easel while I'm painting. I realise I'm standing in front of the painting like this. I'm going to try and make sure that you can see what I'm doing. So I've got some. Uh, Burnt umber here, which I like. Which I'm gonna sort of put down here. So I'm sort of laying down the colours that I want. And I know it's hard to see from where you are. To you, it probably looks all black. But for me, because I'm right up close, I can sort of see all the different, like, you know, different colours this is making. So that kind of looks like just a sort of black mass, doesn't it? I'm gonna move a bit closer so you can see what's going on. Okay, I'm just going to take a breather for a second just to make sure I'm ready with what I'm doing. And uh, so, okay, now what I do is I like to use um, a rag to wipe away the paint and create the image that I want to make. Um, so I basically expose the white underneath, I expose the paper underneath or the canvas underneath, uh, and I sort of create um, a sort of dramatic lighting effect. In, uh, in, ter in the terminology of the old masters, this was called chiaroscura. I hope I pronounced that right. But in Italian, that basically just, it's basically like, uh, it's like looking at a high exposure photograph where you've got lots of darks and lots of lights. And if you look at a painter called Caravaggio from the, from the uh, Renaissance period, he's a huge inspiration for me. Because uh, he's usually got sort of like one, 
source of light that's kind of illuminating the whole room and it's these incredible beautiful religious scenes that he's uh, creating so i'm gonna i'm gonna go right ahead i'm gonna show you what this technique is all about so i've got my rag here and i've got some turpentine i'm gonna do i'm gonna just start start working now at this point i'm gonna start focusing i'm start, gonna start getting into a bit of a flow so i might talk less which might be good um Let's see how this goes. Is anyone listening to good music at the moment? I actually turned my music off because I thought it was a bit of a distraction, but I think I'm actually going to put on... I like to have some sort of calm beats in the background that get me into a good state of mind and a good calm flow. So that's what I'm doing right now. So let's see here. Am I too far away? I hope I'm not too far away for you. Let me move in a little bit. Move in a little bit. So you can see. I want to bring you in. This is an opportunity for me. Sorry about that. Car hooting outside. I hope I didn't. This is an opportunity for me to. Uh, be a bit vulnerable because in the studio when I'm painting by myself I can do something that I don't really like so much and then I can just put it away and say okay no worries I'll try uh, I'll try something else and uh, now now that I'm going live and now that I know I'm conscious of people watching me It's a bit nerve-wracking because uh, I could produce something that's absolutely terrible and uh, you'll all be here to see and witness. I'm just going to... I forgot to say good morning to those of you on the west coast. Good afternoon to all of you in between America and Israel. And a very good evening to those of you in Israel. I hope it's been a good day for you. And I hope that this is uh, going to contribute to putting you into a sort of calm, relaxed state as we settle into the evening here in Israel. Man, I wish I could be uh, playing music in the background as I'm doing this because I'm listening to I'm listening to some some chill <laughs> music that's putting me in a really good mood um, for painting, and uh, I wish that you could sort of experience that as well. But unfortunately, Facebook and Instagram have pretty strict guidelines on playing other people's music in the background of your own thing. I think it's like. You know, copyright issues and stuff like that so whatever you've got for yourself playing while you're while you're chilling and watching the festival and enjoying all the amazing speakers here I hope it's good for you for this uh, for this session So as you can see, it's creating not just white, but there's these sort of different, there's a whole spectrum of colors that kind of starts emerging. 
as I sort of play with the surface of the paper. It's really interesting. For me, it always, it's always a surprise what comes out. Sometimes I'm expecting something completely different. So I told you before that I added a colour here called Elizabeth Crimson and it's actually working really nicely with the blue here, sort of creating like a sort of almost neon city kind of, city lights kind of uh, palette. I'm just going to continue. So I like to make a lot of paintings that depict um, people in prayer. And uh, one of the things that I think about a lot is, is, is prayer and how I can improve it all the time, how, how I can improve my state of mind so that I'm serving God in the best possible way, serving my Creator in the best possible way, being in the right mindset. And uh, for me, I find it incredibly difficult to always be in the correct mindset. That's obviously why we have learning of Hasidus beforehand or meditation before we start. I'm just going to add some more... Uh, But um, I always find that I get distracted in my thoughts. But it's an exercise in meditation. A lot of people think that the prayer in Judaism has nothing to do with meditation. But I think it definitely does. I think that exercise of staying focused on the words you're saying and pulling your attention back to what you're saying each time that your focus drifts, I think it's incredibly important and I think it's just as useful as sitting with your legs crossed and breathing in and out. I think there are different types of meditation. Of course you have interceptive meditation and extraceptive meditation and I think prayer is definitely extraceptive. You're focusing on something perhaps outside of yourself or maybe it's inside of yourself. And uh, yeah, for me it's a daily struggle because there are all kinds of things that come up as I'm praying that I don't want them to be there and I'd rather not be thinking about them and they seem to be contradicting everything I'm doing and you start to question yourself and you start thinking, wow, is everything I'm doing here for nothing? You know, am I just faking it? Why am I even doing this? Why am I even bothering? Of course, that's the wrong reaction. 
the right reaction is to let those thoughts pass on and to allow yourself to drift back into a, a state of prayer and a state of connection. But also to know that having those thoughts is totally normal and not to let them get you down. In the Tanya, I have a favourite couple of chapters. Hey Juliet. And uh, they talk about how a person should not be downhearted, downtrodden, or feel depressed when they have these thoughts that are bothering them, whether it's in their day-to-day -day lives, going about their business, or whether it's when they're involved in spiritual matters. Because it happens to all of us. And uh, what it says over there is that this shouldn't make you sad. In fact, it should make you happy that what you're doing, it, it shows that you're on the right path, that these thoughts are coming to distract you and pull you away. It shows that you're on an upward trajectory and you're doing what you're meant to be doing. And don't for one minute think that you're supposed to be perfect because you're not supposed to be perfect. There's a time, there's a time to take stock. There's a time to sit and think about how you could be doing better. And you need to set times to do that. And I think it's very important to take stock and to sit back and to reflect and think, you know, how can I be doing better? How can I be improving? But when you're going about your daily business and you're focused on what you need to be doing, whether it's raising kids, whether it's in your job, whether it's in your shilohud, whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. So that's not the time. That's not the time to get downhearted. And it's not the time to, I don't even know if downhearted is a word. Is it a word? It is now. Downtrodden. What's the other word? What am I looking for? Well, you start feeling a bit like, yeah, we all get that when we lack energy and we feel a bit depressed. Because we think we're not doing enough, we think we're not enough. But it's not true. And those are not the times to be thinking about that anyway. Those are times for action, times to be, to be getting on with your mission in life and what it is you're supposed to be doing. So I don't know if, from your perspective, you can tell what this is or what it looks like. Um, but I've been talking just now about prayer in Judaism. And so I've probably given away the subject of this piece. But it is indeed a Jewish man wrapped in talut and tefillin. There's a Sefer Torah here in the foreground, which he's touching with his tal talit and kissing. And I think I like to focus on this uh, dual aspect of a person's personality when they're involved in spiritual matters, when they're involved in, uh, in prayer or whatever it is whatever spiritual pursuit it may be. And we've got that aspect of ourselves that pulls us down to earth. We've got our physical desires and our physical needs and our thoughts. And then we've got the meditations that we're saying or thinking about. We've got the things we're trying to achieve and the, you know, we're trying to get closer to ourselves, closer to something. And it's a war within us. And uh, I, sometimes I find the war a little bit I don't know. 
Sometimes it feels like it's a bit too much. And this is a subject that I think uh, mostly men struggle with. And this, for me, is a male gaze at the Jewish experience. I see a lot of incredibly talented female artists depicting the Jewish experience. And I think it's fantastic. But I think, for me, it lacks this reality of how difficult it is for a man to wage war with his physical desires and physical needs while also attempting to attain spiritual uh, closeness. I think it might be something that women struggle less with. I don't know. All I know is that for me it's a struggle and this is how I view the Jewish experience, this is how I view the religious experience and so something I like to explore in my painting using visual language. Well, I think this one for now, I'm going to put away and I'm going to start on another painting. So if you can tell, I don't know if you can see, but it is uh, a Jewish man wrapped in tallit and tefillin. Moving on. How long have I got? Oh, nice. That was half an hour. I've got another half an hour. I hope you're enjoying this and I hope it's uh, interesting for you. I'm definitely enjoying this. I didn't think I would be enjoying this this much. I thought I would be very, very nervous and I thought that I would. Uh... But uh, I am enjoying it. It is nice. I'm sort of less conscious of, uh, you know, of failure and of messing up. I'm just kind of getting into a vibe now, getting into a flow. So I'm just going to add some more paint to my palette. Again, with the Prussian blues, and the burnt umbers, very much into that. So let's go. Let's make a start. I might. Go a little bit different this time. So here you go. For those of you who joined a bit later on, this is my little workstation down here. This is my, my palette. This is what I'm using to work with. I use sort of hardware brushes and I've got my, my yeah, it's a bit of a mess, but that's how I like to work. It's a method to the madness. All right, so I'm gonna start something a bit different now. And, um, 
Another subject that I'm really interested in painting is the subject of the Verbrengen, a Hasidic gathering of Jews when they get together and they sing and they sit and they listen to their Tzaddik talking. I think the Verbrengen is pretty unique actually to Chabad Hasidus. Whereas a tish is more commonly found in other schools of Hasidic uh, groups. They're a bit different in style. A tish is sort of more watching the Rebbe and, and uh, waiting for his cues. Whereas for Brengen seems a little bit more participatory where the Hasidim sort of take part in the experience. So, I was never at a Fabrengen in uh, 770, and I have no idea what it must have felt like to be there. 770, of course, if you don't know, is the centre of the Chabad Hasidic movement, and that's where the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he passed away, I think 30 years ago.